welcome everyone. Uh, we're here today for a um, uh, um, learning forum on the Women's Leadership for Economic Empowerment and mm. Food Security Program, uh, which has been taking place in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Zambia uh, since 2012. And it's very uh, special for us today to really focus in on some of the program initiatives in Ghana. And we're joined today uh, by Cody graduates and our colleagues from Ghana, uh, Dr. Atia Apusiga from uh, the University of Development Studies, uh, Dr. Florence uh, Bamora, also from the University of Development Studies and involved in action research as part of the program, and Linda Atpila, who is a, a global change leader graduate and uh, colleague and uh, graduate, I guess, also of UDS at that level. Um, so we're going to have our session today in a little bit of um, dialogue uh, with our participants. And uh, I will start off with, uh, with Atya. Um, just to focus in a little bit on why is women's leadership so important for Ghana, Ghana's development, particularly in the northern regions where um, Empower is working in Upper East and Upper West region. Thank you, Vicky, and good morning, everyone. I, I think that there are some issues that cannot be contested when we talk about development. And one of them is that gender is real. Gender inequality is real, and that uh, women's empowerment is central to that. Um, in terms of women's leadership, uh, we need women uh, to be at the forefront mobilizing change. We need women to be able to advocate for change. We need women to be able to stand up. So for the Empower Project, it was just critical for us to um, understand that all those women who are in associations and clubs and, and groups and organizations have been contributing in particular ways, um, that we could contribute towards what they have been contributing to by helping build um, certain capacities, nurture those capacities. Um, in ways that will enrich the work that they do already. So women's empowerment has been critical in that too. Thank you. And Florence uh, is a graduate of the Community Development Leadership by Women and as part of the action research has been following up on uh, the economic empowerment training that local partners like CCOD and others have been undertaking. So I'm just interested, Florence, to, if you could comment briefly on what changes have you seen in, in women's economic empowerment at the community level with some of the associations? Uh, thank you. Um, at the community level, UDS partner SECOD and other NGOs in order to promote uh, women's economic empowerment and then uh, leadership, give them a voice in the community. So with, uh, in a collaborative way, we enter the community and then partner with them so that together we generate the knowledge and the knowledge that is generated is shared among the members. So we believe that through action research, which is a participatory research, we could uh, uh, engage the women in the knowledge uh, generation and then also share the knowledge among the partner, that is UDS, SECOD, and other uh, uh, partner organizations. For example, the Ministry of uh, Gender and then ch Children. Um, and then through the research, we've seen that the women actually have um, been able to add value to their income ge generating activities. We have uh, three women groups. One is engaged in basketry, another one in um, uh, shea butter production, but to add value to it, they were trained to turn the shea butter into cosmetic, that's homemade liquid soap and then solid soup. Then we have uh, another one, womb, which is also, um, no, that is the uh, pronet, which is also dealing in soya bean. They've, through the uh, our, our training or our research, we were able to identify 
uh, their training needs, and they were able to turn the soya bean into other uh, products like soya, soya bean milk and or soya bean ke kebab. So they've been able to uh, improve upon the income generating activities. They've been able to uh, gain some kind of confidence because when you have economic power or you increase your economic uh, activities and you gain income, you are, you are able to have a voice at the family level and at the community level. So they've gained some kind of self-confidence and they are able to speak publicly at the uh, community level uh, meetings and other com committees that they meet to discuss about the welfare of their families. Thank you. Linda, um, I know as a Global Change Leader graduate, you had some personal and also um, work and other changes since you graduated, I think, in 2013. Um, so, and you're also passionate about actions in northern Ghana that prevent or alleviate the need for women, young women in particular, to migrate out of their homes and home regions into other parts of the world. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the impacts of CODI training on your trajectory recently? Thank you. I think I'm happy to be back again, not just as a developer, but also an entrepreneur. Um, I think the journey has been quite interesting. When I left in 2013, I got back and there was a model that interest, that, that interest me, which was the digital leaky bucket. I didn't have to use or apply all the models, but I picked that one specifically to work with um, the rural women. But to start with, I, I had to use it on myself, and I started calculating my salary, my expenses, <laughs> and um, I realized that I needed a, a much better job. So I had to um, resign and look for another job. But then notwithstanding, afterwards, um, I realized women had the challenge with how they either manage their businesses or their finances. So I started introducing it into my training programs and um, it was responsive. It was easier for them to understand. It was also um, way much um, self-explanatory for them to also apply and use in their daily activities. And we saw that they started saving. That's how come um, we had most of them also joining the VSLE. That's the village savings and lending um, systems. So that's what, um, that was the turning point for me. And I've ever since been using it. Right now, I've, I've resigned from my, my own job. And I'm working for myself 100% not just for myself, but also because of women. So the idea was to look for young ladies that were in my community and are uh, actually either disadvantaged by the weather conditions and maybe they are forced to move out of the community, not by their own will, but because they don't have any economic activity. So I decided to start with a business which is into share butter processing, and I started with 15 young ladies. And from 2011 till date, we've not only absorbed the 15 young ladies, but we've created market access for over 615 um, rural women now. That is as and when we get um, an export order, either from a middleman or something, we are not able to penetrate directly. But as and when we get um, orders or international orders, we are able to absorb all these 615. And because of that, it has also earned the trust of other organizations that have also been looking up to us. So they, they let us apply our models by training other women that have issues with um, either quality, the way they, they process their butter. So we go out to roll out training uh, models for them. Then afterwards, if there's the chance to absorb their products, then we do that. 
So this is how far we have come with um, my initiative on female migration. But that aside, we've also joined other networks where um, I represent the women. I know it's not all meetings that they can go there to voice out. So I go to represent them to tell, to, to um, on earth some of the issues that are at the grassroots level that policymakers could take into consideration. So one of the issues we had um, last year had to do with conflicting interests with the usage of land, with women share pickers, and then um, the Fulani headsmen. So it was complicated, but it coincided with the research that the World Bank was doing, and they had to pick the issue up to the network to see how they could help us. So I think there's a little I can say mm. for now. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I want to shift a little bit the questions. Um, we've also been um, collaborating in a partnership that does link up uh, with other, other organizations in Ghana and also across the partnership with our colleagues, Women for Change and uh, Organization for Women in Self-Employment in Ethiopia. So Atia, I'll turn back to you and as a a graduate of Rethinking Partnerships and someone who's been able to both engage in some of the Global Affairs Canada consultations and recent CASID events, um, but I know is very active in, in um, Ghana's NetRight Women's Leadership uh, Movement and, and Forum. Can you talk to us a little bit about the impact of the program on these kinds of networks and partnerships that are also expanding the reach of the program? Thank you, Vicky. Um, before I go to the question, let me just say that um, Linda is one clear example of what uh, women's leadership can do, uh, not for themselves, but for other women. Um, Linda had just finished, in fact, I knew her when she was in the final year because of her interest in promoting women's development. And then, before before your graduation, you had a small project to work with women on share. So when we started the initiative, she was one of the first people that came down, oh, this woman, young woman has a lot of potential. Let's see what we can do together. And so she came for the Global Change Leaders, and I think that she has not looked back. And we have been very proud of her contribution as a young woman, a young entrepreneur, but, but a voice for, for women um, in Ghana, and especially Northern Ghana. Um, in terms of partnership, uh, for the University for Development Studies, um, this partnership is supposed to come naturally, and we speak of partnership as everybody who is. I, I see Sheila is in the room, so I'm going to be a bit careful. <laughs> <laughs> she was in, uh, she, she, I was in her partnership course and just uh, yesterday, the day before, last weekend, towards the weekend, she was there again on partnership. You know, so everybody is your partner and so NGOs are partners, local government and anyone you have the opportunity to, sp to speak with. Um, taking that course uh, two years ago, 2016, opened... <laughs> a lot of uh, doors for me to rethink all those initiatives. For me, the, the, the very first thing was to even think about the Empower Partnership that we had and, and to look at what was working and what was not working and really concentrate on how to, to strengthen what was working. Um, immediately for me, it became clear that the work that we did at the community um, was done better with the community women. So we should at least try and be less influential, allow um, the organizations at the community level to work more um, innovatively using their own tools. And then together in the learning, through the action research, we would share and together we'll learn and grow and then move forward. And then at that level, we, I also realized um, in some of our discussions and meetings I shared us that 
the organizations that the NGOs that we work with at that level each had their network strengths and so um, people should be supported to push on with those networks instead of trying to assume that we were a network of our own because of the partnership that we had. Uh, immediately it was clear that some of these organizations could work better on um, the, Af the Alliance for Full Security uh, and Full Sovereignty in Africa. So they worked closely with SECORD. And then the rest of that on women's rights, although the initiative itself. And, and through, through such, um, I don't know, it was not a declared plan or something, but I think in the discussion we just realized that we could do some things better by sharing and distributing our efforts. A and so we strengthened those uh, networks. We had the opportunity to, to share some of the things that we were doing, but also to learn from our network to echo some of the issues together. Um, for instance, through the, the full sovereignty network, one of our probably weakest, and I used to complain a lot about this organization, the Rural Women Farmers Organization. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether they had system. I wasn't sure whether the, the leadership was working well. Um, but just allowing them to be what they are and, and learning from other people. Um, in the end, they emerge as a lead, the leaders of a, a huge campaign when the government of Ghana was trying to introduce the plant breeders bill, you know, and um, I, I was there somewhere and then Florence was also invited. Can you serve on our board? We have been nominated to form the network. Um, uh, the, the campaign was we are the solution campaign and they were leading. You know, these are women in um, a small corner of, of uh, northwestern Ghana, and, and this is what happened to them. And yet, at the beginning, we, we had a lot of concerns um, as a group as to what. Through network, uh, for instance, because network organizes a lot of, um, we, network already has national and international presence. Network participates in uh, uh, UN activities. Network has influence at the African level. So that was a, a bigger platform for us um, to contribute to uh, international policy, to contribute to international programs. But locally, um, it, was, it was one of the things that happened. Network has, it's a, it brings together all kinds of women, associations, groups, NGOs. And one of our associations, the Market Women, Thema Station Women's Association, they were in a clash with the local government authority. They were trying to evict them, you know, modernization of cities, so those women should go. And they, didn't, they were just helpless. They didn't know what to do. And as we mobilize as a group uh, network and Put pressure, um, shared some of the uh, techniques with them as net right. And e eventually, the go local government authority invited them to sit at the table for discussions, and they agreed that they will give them um, some support, at least find a space for them to go to. Otherwise, they were just going to evict them without any provisions. So that was one. Another one where there were some huge flats and we had to come together to contribute. This was just around basic needs. So you know, when you, you connect with other people, when you, you, you open yourself to learn and work with people in partnership, in genuine partnership, I think you are able to achieve more. And, and for me, that is what the partnership has done. Beyond us also, within our bigger Africa-wide as Empower, um, we have, uh, the women in um, Underwise, and then also in Zambia. And uh, I, I talk of them as our life wire. So I could also share on uh, uh, Swopa, Bridget's uh, learning from Wise and how she used that to mobilize not just her organization, but her community to be able to negotiate uh, some resources to promote. So it's, it's really been um, tremendous working in partnership. And, and it's helped me really to 
to think of partnership um, not in traditional ways. Uh, I'm challenged all the time to, to be more innovative, um, to be more discerning when, when, when I, I have to connect with people and work in, in particular ways. Thank you. So one of the uh, key aspects of em Empower Program is to be able to train uh, people both off campus in regional sites and also uh, here at Cody. Um, so I'm going to ask Florence a little bit. Um, she initially is a graduate of uh, one of the first action research courses uh, held in Ghana, which was part of Empower. But now you're back doing asset-based community development. Uh, so how has this opportunity to train in different times and, and, and what brought you into the asset-based community development course this time, Florence? Thank you, Vicky. Um, after the first training, the Women uh, uh, Leadership uh, and Community Development, we went back and then through the access uh, research we, at the community level, we interacted with the women and then came up with uh, our funding and we were able to, um, together with them, we were able to determine their uh, training needs. So after the initial, uh, the first training, we went back into the community to uh, assess the impact of the training. And after that uh, first uh, research, it came out that the women were happy with the training. The, it, it was relevant to their situation. And then the production level had also increased. And those who were initially not part, not involved in the production also came in. So with the increase in production, we realized through the research that there was the, uh, the, the women themselves actually came up that they were facing market uh, uh, problems. So because most of them were uh, producing and they didn't know where else to sell the product. Within their own community, they, they are not able to sell all the product. So we came out that they probably uh, the NGOs, our partners, who have the capacity to uh, train them to uh, make some, uh, give them training on marketing, uh, pro packaging, and also um, other outlets that they can they could sell their uh, product. So through those activities, uh, I realized uh, I realized that the women actually are prepared to take control over over their own um, life to make decisions for themselves, but they actually lack that kind of uh, a training, and they themselves were able to identify it. But comparing that to this second uh, opportunity that I, I got to come and do the ABCD course, I've realized that I could have done things probably in a different way if I had earlier gotten the two. B because as uh, through the research, the women were always complaining about they were happy about the training, okay, but they were also requesting for extra resource. Mm -hmm. they, they needed extra resource in order to buy some of the equipment they needed for the production. For example, those making soap, they asked for income money to make the box and then buy some of the materials for the soup. The basketry people also needed, uh, they asked for some funding in order to buy more straw for the basket. If this, I had uh, earlier on gotten this uh, training, I think I could have then start with them and then look into the community to see whether we could map up asset mapping areas, their own uh, resources or skills that they could use in order to get uh, the support they needed to get the materials, all the materials they needed to increase production. So I think now when I go back with the uh, asset ABCD, I will be in a position to support them and together we'll be able to identify more uh, capacities or more resources that earlier on we overlooked. We didn't take to be uh, important and identify all that so that they'll be able to use that to uh, improve upon their own uh, livelihood. Thank you. We'll open up to some broader questions. 
but I'll, I'll finish also with Linda on uh, the opportunity to come back uh, having you know, uh, graduated from Global Change Leaders and then also changed her own uh, work and, and uh, livelihood uh, in initiatives and is now working as an entrepreneur. And so what's the importance of being able to now join the Livelihoods and Markets Initiative for the kinds of work you're doing in Ghana? Thank you. I think when I was coming, there were two things I had in mind to um, voice out, which was uh, market access. It was, it was a big issue for us because when you look at the share value chain, you have at the bottom of the, the base of the, the value chain being dominated by women. But as you go up, then it's male dominated. So my target has been that I step a bit forward so that we can um, make a headway because we produce yet we, we are unable to um, sell and get the required price that we, we actually deserve for the product. But my exposure and what I've learned from my course has been mind blowing. I don't have an excuse to say there's no market. We have to do the right thing and we have to go all out there to know who we are communicating with or who um, the actors are and how can we communicate to, to link up to ensure that we get that market, that, that market access that we are looking for. We also did something shortly this morning on uh, value, chain, value chain financing, which has to do with, um, let's say I'm a local producer, there's a buyer. I go to a bank to say that, can you advance me some money so that I could either export my product and there are challenges, what do I do? That has also unearthed a lot of things because um, we had an opportunity like that, but I, I knew the issues about um, rural banks or banks for that matter in Ghana if you don't have a collateral and it, it becomes um, a huge problem if you are a young person, not to talk of a woman, they would not look at your face twice. They may come and look at your side, but they wouldn't um, step in for you. So with all those um, exposure and information, I'm going to work hard. I would, I would like to have further discussion with my, my facilitators as well to see what um, I can do. But the way forward is to get to the middle of the chain, not at the bottom. <laughs> and um, we are going to do better than we are doing right now. One thing I didn't mention was the coaching or the mentorship that I also had from um, Cody by my connection with Dr. Tia, that 60% of what I really needed wasn't financial. It was knowledge. It was about what step to take next. What do I do when I'm stuck? Who do I talk to? There were times she's busy, but she made time to come home because she was in a different region. She's in, she's in Tamale and I'm in Borga but we had to find a common platform to see how I could um, get access to her. And she spent most of her time listening and then advising me on issues that really affected me um, going forward. And I think that was a critical part that um, I learned from. Okay, thanks very much uh, for those comments. and. I hope you got a sense of uh, Empower. Uh, we do work with predominantly uh, women leaders in the different organizations. Uh, the organizations on the ground are working with rural women farmers. And uh, we've also been able to link um, different people such as Linda and others from organizations like Netright in country to training. Um, we focused on action research so that there is evidence to change how uh, civil society and other actors do things on the ground. Um, but I'm going to open it up to questions. So thank you very much to our three panelists. Very good to see all of you back at Cody. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask, um, I guess, first of all, a question to Dr. Florence, a little bit about your action research approach and the way you mentioned that you're 
you're um, engaging women. And you know, we, we run a program here that looks at action research that's citizen-led and community-driven that's consistent with the other work that we do across Cody and, and, and with partners. But you know, do you see something specific that you, you've been doing in terms of methodology that's really helped to move you know, that citizen-led approach for, you know, go forward and, and in particularly with women so that they're not just um, engaged in some small pieces of it or information is not just gathered from them, but they're, they're actually decision makers in the research process. They're actually generating research questions. And, you know, where do you see, where do you see that going? And I guess as a follow-on question, maybe I would ask um, Dr. Atia, um, you know, the ways in which the, the UDS and the space that you're occupying as a leader at UDS, the way that that's also shifting in terms of gender equality and gender equality agendas, and we know how difficult it is to do that in university spaces. So what is it that you're able to do within that space as well? And just a huge congratulations to Linda, who joined at Cody at the GCL just about the same time I did five years ago, and I just see such tremendous success and um, as you've said Dr. Atia just a, such a rising star so thank you so much. Uh, thank you Irene. Uh, as I indicated uh, earlier the action research is participatory it is, it is, it is inclusive so initially when we entered the community all the partners uh, women organization the local chiefs, women leaders, uh, we interact with them. <coughs> and through the interaction, we we'll make them understand that we want to build together. It's not that we are coming, we have the solution to all their problems and we're coming to give it to them. But together, we'll jaw jaw and then come out with a, a solution. What they think can move their community forward. So through that exercise, giving them the assurance that they could, uh, they, they could speak their mind, uh, I think through the exercise, they've been able to, to allay that kind of uh, stage fright or, or public speaking. And then they are now able to uh, speak freely uh, in public. So our subsequent meetings, if you compare the earlier interaction and subsequent one, we could see that they were, they've now gained some kind of assertiveness and they are able to speak from the bottom of the, their heart. They discuss issue freely, and I think that is what ASEAN research is all about, building knowledge with the community and sharing it with them. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add a little, um, the action research has been um, done in order to provide, um, to learn lessons for training. So it's, it's also interesting to, to observe the women over time taking over and shaping the program itself. Uh, because the, the team goals, they have those interactions and then they go back, they say, well, did we get you right? And there have been times that they have challenged some of their interpretations and notions that they had collected from them. But I think the most interesting part is when the training team takes over, goes to them again and say, okay, so from what we did in the last research, this is what we agreed on to do. And today we are here to then build the capacity. You know, so, so Constantly, they saw their ideas being put to test and being put to use by themselves, and then the result that was coming out of it. So I think that that has been very exciting for me, um, but also for, for the women who have been involved in this. Um, in terms of the question that you asked, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's not easy <laughs> to sit uh, in the position of leadership. And, and, and for me, that that's probably was my biggest motivation to participate in, 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 in Empower, um, to find out, to, to, to at least have a space where I could engage with other women, 
leaders. Our first meeting here, I was um, all to meet other women doing things, amazing things elsewhere. And I thought that it was a great opportunity. How did they really survive in the context that they work? And Emily and I spoke at length. Each time we meet, we have a lot of things to. Uh, to cut a very long story short, I think that for me, it shifted considerably um, my approach to resistance, in particular as a woman, um, and, and to look for and work for spaces that I felt were more empowering and enhancing of me and what contributions I had to make. Learning from these women who have been in, in the field um, for a very long time. Um, it also enabled me at the programming level to initiate some process in very subtle, more subtle ways that received acceptance. Um, for instance, we have a, an uh, if uh, Sheila will remember, my project at the end of the course was to look at uh, my, the Faculty of Education and its relationship. One of the target areas was to look at our um, professional education program. This is where our students will go out and do their practice. Um, and so when we went back, um, I'm not sure whether we did the curriculum workshop before this, but what happened was I, I tried to, I, I held a number of meetings. They were not core meetings, no. Um, the project program officer is in his office and I just passed there, how are you this morning? What things are going on? And gradually I was sharing some of the ideas and helping to shift his understanding of the initiative because we work, we send the student, place the students in the schools and we are supposed to work with teachers who would serve as their mentors. But oftentimes, that connection is not good enough. We just please go back, we are assessing and want to know. We are in a, this thing in a long haul, for a long haul. So we need to find ways, strategic ways of uh, working with the teachers and the school heads so that they would appreciate our philosophy but then also help us to develop a better way of working together. And one of the things that came immediately, he organized, you no, know, over a period, he organized some trainings. So that brought the, the men, mentors to the campus, and he also strengthened his coordination visits to the schools. And it's, it's evolving, it's not done yet, but it's evolving, and I can see that the way I approach it, you know, it's, it's actually shifted him a bit from the initial policy. So at some point, so where is your policy guideline? He says, oh, I, I need to revise some things. And for me, I thought that it had happened again. It's, the other thing is, um, I this, it helped me to find better ways of working with the women, very few of us in the faculty. And, and sometimes it's really very difficult um, to appreciate one another as women. Um, it's, it's easy for me, especially when I sit in the position of privilege, to think that every other woman could get there in the ways that I did. And learning from all of that, I, 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 I understood better, or I began to understand the struggles of the young women and found ways to to hold their hands, not too tight, <laughs> you know, but allowing them space to address the, the things that were of interest and concern for them, but also um, enabling them to participate in a space that's too difficult, too harsh, and too demanding, you know, so to be able to balance, to find where the leaks are in the bucket, uh, plug those that you can plug, but um in in the end it is you 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 survive or you die out so i don't know i could go on and on but i think that <laughs> a, a lot of things have happened for me yes thank you very much other young entrepreneurs coming up in northern ghana 
Okay, I'm going to try to answer that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so for me, I would say it's not a rosy place. Mm -hmm. It's not a comfortable place. Um, if you're an upcoming young entrepreneur, you really have to be passionate about it because once everything is gone and that passion is not there, you, you can be sure that you would back out. But if passion is there and you know why you are doing it, like my facilitators would say, if there's a social motive behind it, you wouldn't want to let other people down, so you will stick to it and stick through to the end. So money shouldn't be a problem. Most young people say that I don't have money. I have the idea, but I don't have money. You have to start something. Before somebody can trust you, before somebody can entrust more into your hands, the fellow would need to see evidence on the ground. The fellow would need to see what you have done, your track record before the fellow will come in to assist you. So money shouldn't be a factor. There's a, a, a thousand or a million of issues out there that young people shouldn't wait and say that there is unemployment, but they should. They, sh they should plug in and then work very hard. And I think together we'll connect the dots and make sure we, we get a bigger picture out of it in the end. Thank you. Women uh, in the Empower program in both Ethiopia and Zambia and what you feel you have um, gained from their insights and um, experiences and what you feel you've contributed to them. Well, thank you for the question. In terms of... Um, what we have gained as, as the Ghana group, it's, it's been their work at the grassroots. The, the Zambian uh, groups work on popular education methodologies. And um, the, the way they are able to mobilize the women um, at that level, their the, the approach to messaging, um, you know, some of the activities that they even engage in were, were quite interesting because our own interest has also been to, to be able to, um, I don't know, um, animate communities in, in, to the extent that they can take on their own issues. And, and so um, for me, that was a very Im uh, an important learning point for me. Um, but also just listening to them um, personally as, as I just listening to their experiences and their stories, um, anytime we had the opportunity to engage with whether it's their board and, and the amazing and incredible people they put together to help with their thinking, I mean, that, that for me was useful learning. Um, we, had, we had occasion also to send, um, I think two or three people to, to Zambia to actually participate in training programs on, on the popular education methodologies and then they came to apply that at their organizational level. The, the same in, in it, Ethiopia. Um, um, one of the big things that came out of Ethiopia also after uh, Bridget had gone for training in uh, the village savings, um, village, the VSLA, mm -hmm. yes. So she came back, there were two of them who went, one from two organizations, and they came back and together they organized um, train of trainers for the rest of them. But beyond that, um, Bridget, the woman among them, there was a, a young man and a young woman, the woman among them decided to try that, because one of her biggest challenges, and Florence has already noted that, how to get uh, funds to be able to improve upon their program. So she decided to initiate the uh, village savings uh, program. And, and I think it's working very well for her. They are mobilizing their own resources. Um, she was also able to mobilize the entire community. They've worked in the community, her own stories. And when you look at the stories of change, I think she, her story is one of them. Um, she, they've been in that community for pro close to probably 30 years. She is the second generation of leadership there. Um, the, the founder was just a very passionate woman, retired teacher, whose mother was um, 
into arts and crafts. And so when she retired, she decided to invest in adding value to that. And uh, I met Bridget when she was still very young. She was just helping out. And now she's taking over the organization. This was an opportunity for her to, to learn and drive the organization at a time that um, external support for them had almost dried out. They were depending on their own internal resources. So she, she did this. Um, she was able to get the entire community together for a festival, and through that process, she was able to showcase the work that um, they were doing, but also then to invite their support um, to the women who are coming from the household. In fact, they had been benefiting from the organization all this while. They, they promote ecotourism also, apart from the crafts. And the ecotourism initiative is done. Um, they send people to the homes of um, individual homes or family homes where the women have some paintings and they would, the earnings from that will be shared. You know, so the communities have always benefited. That is also from the community. It's always been her organization. So she decided to make that shift and to expand the ownership. You know, so for me, that, that, was, that was really um, great learning because of what she learned from, from, from the WISE group and what they did um, in terms of mobilizing communities.